Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're welcoming Sandeep Jahar, who is a practicing cardiologist. And today, we're discussing his new book, Heart, A History. Sandeep, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, what inspired you to write the, a book about the history of our heart? Well, I've been fascinated by the heart uh, since I was a child. Uh, I, I happen to have a uh, malignant family history of heart disease, and um, uh, my paternal grandfather actually died um, of sudden death um, after a heart attack uh, before I was born. I never met him, uh, but my father actually witnessed his sudden death, and it really affected my father and, by extension, his children um, you know, throughout our lives. Uh, and so that, uh, and then, you know, in addition to my paternal grandfather, my maternal grandfather, uh, also died of a sudden heart attack and eventually my mother died of a heart attack. So, um, there's this, um, you know, malignant gene, uh, you know, in our family, um, that predisposed, um, us to, to heart problems. And, you know, when I was growing up, I, I sort of feared the heart as, you know, the executioner of, uh, people in the prime of their lives, and um, you know, and 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 that really kind of suffused the way I thought about you know the body and about life in general. You know, the the, the heart is the only organ that can kind of snuff out your life suddenly. You know, you could be healthy and then just die suddenly, um, unlike any other um, condition in 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 the human body. So, so that was part of it, and and. You know, and the scientist in me just is fascinated by the heart as a machine. It's really the most amazing machine that nature has invented. Uh, it's a machine that 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 beats three billion times in a typical human lifetime, and pumps blood through a hundred thousand miles of blood vessels. Um, it's constantly working. When it stops working, life ends. Uh, so it's it's just. You know, from the scientific perspective, from a family history perspective, um, and then finally, just the history of it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the the history of how we have figured out stuff about the heart, um, you know, which we can talk about, is just is is um, you know is really mesmerizing, and it's something that I that I learned a lot about in the course of researching this book. Well, and your your book was actually um, a, a very interesting read. I mean, it's a history of heart disease and a history of of all of um, you know the, the medical history, but it, it's not it's not dry. I was actually fascinated. So, you, you know, you emailed me last night asking if I had questions for you, and I'm still reading your book, um, mm. and you know, because I, I I couldn't put it down. I actually spent all day reading it, um, mm. which is Thank a great you. testament to to how it's written. It's just so so vivid, and um, I'm sure you. there's a lot of people who pick it up and don't realize they're just going to read it in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I wanted to braid many different um, uh, genres in the, in, in the book, so it's not just a history or a scientific history per se, it's a social and cultural history also, as well as a personal history. So there's memoir, there's biography, and there's history all kind of braided together. Yeah, and, you know, I, I did find it fascinating because right in the beginning of the book you talk about how um, our, our heart traditionally is thought to hold our, our soul and our emotions. And so I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, and this is exactly what we are, we are taught. Our heart houses our shen or our soul spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I don't think that that's the only culture that that talks about that. It is definitely no. something that um, you know is is around a lot. Can you just talk about that for a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the heart was always um, thought to be, you know, the, um, the house of the soul. And that's a cross-cultural idea. Um, the repository of the emotions. Uh, the Greeks thought of the heart as, because it occupies such a central place in the body as, you know, both the seat of the soul, but also as a sentry to warn the body about dangers. And, um, you know, in some sense, there, there's a lot of truth to that in, in the way that our hearts respond to stress and, um, and danger. You know, we, it speeds up. Um, our blood pressure goes up. Um, you know, damage ensues if that kind of stress um, becomes chronic, uh, or even if it's acute, but it's very, very severe. Uh, and one of the themes that I really explored in the book is that, you know, what is the connection of this, this metaphorical heart to the biological heart? So we historically, you know, in the pre-scientific era, thought of the heart as uh, in a metaphorical way, uh, that, you know, it's, it is the seat of the soul. It's, it's, the, it's where our emotions reside. And, you know, now we know that, that the heart doesn't actually, in fact, contain the emotions per se, but one of the themes that I try to delve into very deeply in the book is that our emotional lives have a tremendous effect on how our hearts function and perform. Uh, and, you know, one example of that intersection of the biological heart with the metaphorical heart is the broken heart syndrome. Uh, you know, and in the broken heart syndrome, uh, the heart actually acutely weakens um, when the body is suffering acute stress, often in the form of grief over the loss of a loved one or a romantic breakup. And the heart actually changes shape and acutely weakens, and patients can develop congestive heart failure, life-threatening arrhythmias, even death. Uh, now, so, you know, even though the heart may not contain the emotions per se, our emotional lives are written on our hearts. It's, it's kind of the physiological canvas upon which our emotions are most easily written in the body. And so I try to explore that idea um, in, in, in various ways throughout the book. Well, and I, I think you start the book with um, a story about your grandfather, which is probably a really good example of this. Um, can you just tell us what, what that story is, how he died? Yeah, well, he, uh, he was living in um, post-partition India. Uh, it was uh, the summer of 1953, and he had a small shop uh, uh, to which he went um, that morning, the morning that he died, and he actually um, was bitten by a snake. Uh, now, he, when he came home, by all accounts, he was doing okay, uh, and he sat down for lunch, and um, my father was with him, and midway through lunch, um, at least the family, you know, story um, that I've heard is that neighbors had gone um, and had killed the snake and brought it to him. It turned out the snake was a cobra. And he took one look at the cobra and he said, how can I survive this? And he slumped to the floor and, um, and, and immediately died. Uh, the, uh, an ambulance came uh, and this was actually, I think, um, at least a couple of hours later, believe it or not. Uh, it, was a, it was a very, it was a village in, in um, central India and uh, the ambulance was just making a routine drive-by and the family flagged it down. Anyway, the ambulance took my grandfather and the snake, actually, to a hospital and the, the doctors told my family that, that the grandfather had not died of a snake bite, but he died of a sudden heart attack. Nothing else could have killed him 
so quickly, so suddenly. Um, and so it was probably initiated by fright over the snake bite and what it might mean. Um, but he had a sudden cardiac death, which is one of the most common causes of death throughout the world. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, my family was, um, uh, lost really without their patriarch. And, uh, this was in the 1950s in India, and um, there were a lot of cultural um, baggage around being a widow. Um, so my grandmother had a very difficult time keeping the family together. She had five children to support. Um, and so that death, you know, his death really affected my father so deeply and kind of l- lent a, a kind of grief through, to our home at various times throughout my childhood. And, and that's really what um, uh, kind of colored my thinking about the heart and inspired me to become a heart doctor. Um, well, you know, stories like that, um, I think, are what makes people so afraid of heart disease. I think cancer is also in that category. It's a little bit slower, but sometimes you don't find out you have stage 4 cancer until it's too late. Um, and it's yes. so unpredictable. And this is also unpredictable. I mean, if you don't have symptoms... Um, and, you know, your grandfather obviously didn't know, even if he did have symptoms, that he had heart disease or sometimes just that shock, as in um, with the broken heart syndrome, where it's just something that that gets us in that moment. Um, yes. But, you know, the, it, it is something people are, are very afraid of um, mm-hmm. because, it, like you said, it is so sudden. If your heart doesn't work, nothing works. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I mean... Um... You know, the the uh, brain cannot function without um, a functioning heart. In other words, if there's no blood flow to the brain, um, you have brain death. But the heart actually does not need the brain to function. Um, people who are in a brain dead state uh, can have their um, a func- functioning heartbeat for uh, weeks if not months, the heart is really an autonomous player in the body. And so it's really kind of a central uh, actor in the maintenance of our health. Uh, The heart doesn't actually, incidentally, pump blood just to the rest of the body. It also pumps blood to itself. You think about how amazing that is. Uh, You know, we can't see our own eyes. Um, But but the heart actually sustains itself. If the heart doesn't beat, it cannot beat. Um, and so, uh, you know, those kinds of aspects of the heart physiology just fascinate me. Well, you know, and, and, and I, I think you're right. Um, there's so much that happens in our body that just happens, <laughs> you know. Our heart continues to beat um, without us having to think about it. Um, mm. So I want to go a little bit more on, on the emotional side, um, you know, when we're looking at what the heart does, but also how it is affected. Um, you know, we know that when we get anxiety, our heart can flutter, um, and, uh, you know, we can have those feelings. It can race. Um, and definitely affect us. And then I know you talk in your book about actually long-term damage. Um, is it, is it, can you just talk about, about the relationship there with our emotions and with heart disease? Well, <clears throat> they're, 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 uh, there, there's a very strong connection between emotional stress and heart disease. Now, in the uh, broken heart syndrome, it's acute stress. You know, the death of a spouse is the sort of archetypal example of what precipitates broken heart syndrome. Um, or um, a uh, uh, loss of a, of a romantic relationship. Uh, I've had um, many patients. Um, I'll give you one example. There's a, a, a woman whose uh, husband died, uh, and it was the, the death was um, expected. And, you know, she was sad, of course, but she was probably a little relieved um, because it had been a very long illness. He had had dementia and, um, and 
you know, be, being a caregiver for him had been, um, you know, inordinately difficult for her. Um, so, you know, about a week after the funeral, she looked at his picture and she got teary. And, uh, and then all of a sudden she started getting chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, you know, she couldn't catch her breath sitting in a chair, sleeping in a, in, in a chair. She eventually came to see me. We did an ultrasound of her heart and her heart had acutely weakened uh, to less than half its normal function. Apparently, she, um, you know, after the grief had subsided, we did another echocardiogram and her heart function had returned to normal. Uh, and during the, during the phase in which she was you know, acutely grieving, the heart um, shape changed into the shape of what's called a takasubo, which is a, uh, which is a word for a Japanese octopus trapping pot with a very wide base and a narrow neck. And, and, and so this condition, broken heart syndrome, is actually also called takasubo cardiomyopathy. And it's something that's seen not just after romantic breakups or loss of loved one. It's actually also seen in situations of widespread social upheaval, like after a hurricane. Um, uh, the number of Takasubo cases go, goes up dramatically after hurricanes or other natural disasters. So broken heart syndrome is an example of what acute emotional stress can do. But coronary artery disease uh, is an example of... Uh, it can result from chronic emotional stress. So, um, you know, I talked about my grandfather. Uh, he was in his 50s when he died. But prior to the snake bite and the shock of, the, of seeing the snake, he had um, moved with my family um, out of uh, uh, Pakistan into India uh, when the country was partitioned after... Uh, India got its independence, and there was a huge, widespread social upheaval at that time. People were, were there was a huge fighting between Muslims and Hindus and so on, and he lost all his property, all his money, and had to start anew in this new community in Kanpur. And that stress, I have no doubt, um, caused um, acceleration of coronary disease that then um, in the end, uh, you know, ended up in a, in a heart attack after that acute precipitant after the snake bite. So there's very good evidence that, that chronic emotional stress can also cause heart disease. And you know, there have been studies uh, like the Whitehall study that looked at um, British civil servants, uh, you know, British workers who have less control over their lives uh, in terms of their workplace um, environments. Um, have less autonomy, tend to have more heart disease. Um, that's after correcting for cholesterol, blood pressure, you know, uh, smoking, etc. So we know that emotional stress can cause heart disease, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and that's an area that really needs much more exploration. I, well, I definitely agree with you on that. I mean, there's... Um I'm always a little bit conflicted because I know that a lot of the time when, um, you know, doctors can't figure someone out, they tell them that it's, it's just anxiety when sometimes mm-hmm. there is a legitimate reason for their symptoms. We just don't know everything yet. But also mm-hmm. we know that our emotions do affect us on, on every level with, with everything. So I, I think that it needs to be, um, well, definitely studied more, but then, um, you know, a plan to, to help people. Our, our world is getting way more stressful than it used mm-hmm. to be. And, 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 you know, that's difficult for everybody to deal with and probably affecting us when we're dealing with, you know, the go, go, go um, attitude yeah. that comes with a big city or a corporate job. It's extremely stressful on everybody. Yeah. I mean, let me give you just one example. If, uh, uh, there, there was a, uh, a big study done, um, you know, in the 1990s on regression of coronary artery disease. And in this study, there were two groups. One group sort of did normal stuff, normal diet, um, and then another group did um, uh, intensive low-fat diet, exercise, and stress reduction. 
um, with sort of group psychosocial support. Now, the, the intensive group had regression of coronary disease. The regular group had progression. Now, the interesting thing in this study was that there were some people in the regular group who actually on their own adopted very intensive, low-fat diets and exercise plans, just on their own. They still had progression of their coronary disease uh, because they didn't do the stress reduction portion. In, in fact, at, at uh, one and five years, stress reduction was more clearly correlated with coronary disease improvement or regression than was exercise. So, so there, you know, it's not just something that we just talk about or observe, but there is hard data to show that, that reducing the amount of emotional stress in your life uh, will uh, improve your heart health. Yeah, that's um, that's good to know. I think that you know, every time I I do a show, no matter what we're talking about, I just see that you know things need to make a shift. We need to focus more. You know, our, our priorities I think are wrong, and and overall of society that you know if we have that go 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 attitude, and you know the people yeah. that that feel shame from just taking me time, and um, you know, right. it's a very common feeling, um, and we know how important that is for us. But there's so much shame and guilt around it. Um, You know, we have to be as tough as we can and push ourselves as much as we can so that we're at at the end of our rope. And, yeah, we're we're living our lives in overdrive so much of the time. Our hearts are beating faster than they should. Our blood pressure is higher than it should be. Um, Our, you know, too much adrenaline is coursing in our bloodstream. Um, and that has uh, profound effects on our heart health. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's important. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Sandeep Jahar. We're discussing his book, Heart, A History. And we'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Thank you. 
You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Sandeep Chahar, and he is the author of Heart of History. It's actually his third book, and it um, just came out. Um, And I know that it's been... um, Through the cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Sandeep Chahar, and he is the author of Heart of History. It's actually his third book, and it um, just came out. Um, And I know that it's been um, a bestseller, and I can definitely see why. Um, It's a very interesting read, so I do recommend, you know, anyone with a heart to pick it up. Um, So, Sandeep, uh, one thing you talk about in your book, which, you know, I never thought about. The Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Sandeep Chahar, and he is the author of Heart of History. It's actually his third book, and it um, just came out. Um, and I know that it's been um, a bestseller, and I can definitely see why. Um, it's a very interesting read, so I do recommend you know anyone with a heart to pick it up. Um, so, Sandeep, uh, one thing you talk about in your book, which, you know, I never thought about, wasn't too much of a surprise just with the way we are, but it was for a long time taboo to operate on the heart. Can you just tell us a little bit about that history? Sure. Well, uh, some of the taboo derives from the fact that the heart was considered, you know, the central actor in the body. Uh, not only does it occupy a central place in the body, but, um, you know, it was also thought to, uh, uh, you know, house the soul. Uh, so there were a lot of sort of cultural taboos that had to be overcome before people wanted to mess with the heart, uh, before they uh, were able to operate on it. In fact, you know, even as late as the late 19th century, the heart had never been operated on. Every other major organ in the body, including the brain, had been operated on. The liver, the kidneys, the lungs, but not the heart. Now, part of it was because of the taboos associated with, um, you know, messing with the soul. Uh, but some of it were just scientific obstacles. And some of them are probably pretty obvious to your listeners. Uh, the first is the heart is always moving. Uh, it's very hard to cut and suture something that's moving the way the heart is. Uh, number two, the heart is filled with blood. In fact, uh, the, the, the entire blood supply in the human body passes through the heart uh, about once a minute. So if you cut a hole to fix something inside the heart, you would bleed to death. You'd bleed, you would bleed to death very quickly, probably within about a minute or so. So, um, so those two obstacles um, were thought to be almost insurmountable. You know, how do you operate on something that's constantly moving and filled with blood? Well, the obvious solution is to stop it from moving and to empty it of blood before you operate on it. But problem there is that you've got to do the operation really, really quickly, like within a matter of a minute or so, or you develop brain damage. So the, 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 the ultimate solution would be to take over the, heart, the heart's function via an artificial machine. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, cut open the heart and fix the hole or whatever you have to do, and then uh, reintroduce blood into the um, fixed heart and, uh, and then uh, detach the machine. Now, it took a really long time to build that machine. Part of it, the reason 
were 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 the very cultural taboos that you know that that I just mentioned. You know, people just thought, how how can you replace the 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 functioning human heart with machine made of plastic and metal? Um, so that was one issue. So it took a long time to build that machine. So while that machine was being built, people came up with some of the most outlandish ideas for how to take over the heart function. And I'll just mention one briefly. Um, it was an idea by um, probably the most innovative surgeon of the 20th century, um, a, g- a guy named Walter Lillehei, um, who worked in Minneapolis. And his idea came from observing what happens when a fetus is being nourished by, um, by uh, its mother, you know, its pregnant mother. So a fetus doesn't breathe, doesn't take breaths because it's floating in fluid. It gets oxygen from its from the mother. So Lillehei reasoned, well, why can't I hook up another human being to a human being that I want to operate on? Have that that first human being's um, you know blood circulate through the second human being while I stop the second human being's heart, cut it open, fix it, and then detach the two humans and hope for the best. And, um, and he did these experiments initially in dogs and, um, and, and it took a long time to figure out how to do, you know, how to hook up the circuits right. But eventually he mastered this technique called cross-circulation in dogs and eventually tried it on, on people. And uh, it's it still considered probably the most innovative and remarkable surgery in the history of humankind. And it was done in America in the early 1950s. And it was done almost exclusively by Lillehei for about a year and a half until a functioning heart, heart lung machine was available. Um, that, yeah, it was pretty amazing to, to read about <laughs> that in your book and, and all, all the details. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's not something that we think about now and, and, you know, I, I've never had anybody close to me go through heart surgery, so it wasn't really anything I, I thought about anyway. Um, just right. hadn't, you know, people, oh, you had surgery, okay, and then we kind of move on. But it wasn't, I never thought about the details of what's actually happening, and, and really you're you're stopping somebody's heart when you're doing this surgery, and they're still alive after, which is amazing. It is amazing. I, it still amazes me, and I'm, I'm a cardiologist. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I can definitely um, under understand that. I mean, it must you know we see stuff on TV and we know open heart surgery. That's something I think that's um, gets a lot of TV shows. You know, heart surgeons. Right. Um, but you know, you always think it's sensationalized and and um, you don't really think about it. Probably not often quite as dramatic as a TV show, but probably even more amazing in real life to see that happen. It really is. In fact, in the book, I, I spend a chapter uh, talking about the heart-lung machine, the development of the heart-lung machine, but also pair it up with the personal experience of, of you know, uh, being in at, at my parents' home on a, a Christmas Eve and um, at, at a party and and, have, and having one of the guests, uh, a cardiac surgeon, invite me out. In, in the mid- middle of, uh, of a snowstorm, to the hospital to watch him operate on, on, on a person, uh, in a, and as my my first uh, open heart surgery um, viewing, uh, I didn't really I can't say I participated. I was uh, relatively er- early on in my career, uh, but it was uh, absolutely fascinating. I, I I can't forget it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is amazing. No. Um one other thing that that you we you talk about is a defibrillator, um, mm-hmm. which is something people have permanently installed. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, defibrillators are uh, tiny machines made of metal that get implanted inside the body, and they have wires that go to the heart, um, and uh, monitor the heartbeat, and if the heart 
rhythm degenerates into something life-threatening, the machine can, can shock the heart out of the malignant rhythm. So it's like the paddles that they use in the ER, but it's inside you. It's always monitoring your heartbeat. Uh, and I talk about how defibrillators were um, invented. It was, uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating story. Um, like most of uh, um, progress in heart medicine, you know, the first pacemaker was invented essentially by mistake by an engineer in upstate New York who picked the wrong resistor, hooked it up to a transistor, and the whole circuit started to pulse once a second. And he thought, wow, this is fascinating. This is like a human heartbeat. And, and that circuit was actually used in the first pacemakers. And it was discovered by mistake. The defibrillator... Uh, was um, uh, was was developed um, in Baltimore um, by uh, a Jewish man who um, uh, barely escaped the concentration camps. Uh, so there there are just there are fascinating stories of how um, you know these devices were were invented. Um. One thing, I think it was when you were talking about defibrillators, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but you had somebody's wife asked you if her husband would still love her if he had, uh, I think it was a defibrillator put in, but it, it, any sort of surgery, which I think, you know, actually is a valid point with how we feel about the heart, um, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, a, co- a common fear. Um, yeah. You know, are we going to still feel the same way if if we do the surgery or we, you know, have a, a device in our chest that keeps our heart yeah. going? Yeah, this this was uh, the wife of, uh, it is actually the, 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 the first uh, patient who received a permanent artificial heart. Um, and uh, it was in 1982 in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, this gentleman, his name was Barney Clark received uh, the first permanent artificial heart. In other words, his heart was taken out of his body and essentially discarded. And he had a heart made of plastic and metal inserted into his chest. That's a total artificial heart. And um, it's not really how we do things today. We tend to put pumps that augment the heart's, the native heart's function. Um, but this was the first total artificial heart. And um, Barney Clark's wife of 39 years asked the doctors, will he still be able to love me? Um, and it does speak to the central place in, of the heart in our emotional lives um, and our, you know, sort of cultural imagination. Yeah, and definitely powerful, um, you know, to, to think about that. And so then if... If we have, if we go with that metaphor, if we have heart disease, is our, is our love different there as well? Because our our heart is being damaged, um, and you know, if stresses are affecting our heart, can the opposite happen? Can our heart affect our feelings? Well, I mean, I think our hearts do affect our feelings. I think it's a two-way traffic. So, emotional upset can lead to, you know, heart speeding up, um, you know, and, and, and lead to damage in the ways that we've talked about. But, you know, I have many patients who develop, um, you know, arrhythmias, uh, automatic arrhythmias, uh, the heart speeds up for whatever reason. And then, the, and then after that, feeling their heart going wild in their chest, that precipitates tremendous panic and anxiety. Uh, in fact, um, you know, uh, uh, I've, I've had patients who have developed panic attacks um, because of uh, atrial arrhythmias. And when we uh, cure the arrhythmia through various techniques um, uh, that, you know, we can talk about, but, but there are ways of essentially ablating the arrhythmias out of the heart, um, their panic attacks go away. They, they no longer need, you know, uh, drugs, uh, you know, anti-anxiety medications. So, so there's a two-way 
traffic between our emotional brain centers and our heart. That's um, really powerful to to understand that, you know, we're affecting our, not just our heart, but our other organs as well. We're affecting our health with certain emotions or helping it with, with other ones, um, you know, stress reduction and finding joy. Um, and it also can go the other way where a certain um, issue can affect us. Um, and, and, you know, can sometimes give peace because if you're having panic attacks and you don't understand why, <laughs> um, because yeah. there's no reason to be um, panicky and you've never experienced that before, sometimes that can even send you down a spiral of why are you all of a sudden being affected when there might be that legitimate cause on the other end. Um, so we're, yeah. we're very complicated. <laughs> We are very complicated. I think that's a, that's a, that's a very tidy summing up. <laughs> our hearts, <laughs> our emotional lives, and the connection between our emotional hearts and our biologic hearts are is very complicated. Yeah, I, I you know I always find this this fascinating. I mean, it's it's. Um, yeah. Just to know that, I mean, especially with Chinese medicine, we talk about um, the the emotions that are affecting organs, and um, the other way around, uh, you know, what symptoms come come with things, and 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 all of that. So it, it's it's deeply ingrained in my belief system and what I've been taught to look at all of that. And then I think it gets it gets forgotten on some level as well, where we're just kind of go go go, and we don't pay attention to those things. But you definitely in your book um, you, you know you, you you bring in a this you go in this kind of circle of um, the history and then you know where we are now and um, what is important for us to understand right I, you know it, it, you know the the arc of the book is you know it starts talking about um, the metaphorical heart the way that the natural philosophers, thought of the heart and and that was basically um you know as the you know repository of emotions and so the emotional metaphorical heart was how people thought about the heart in the pre-scientific era and then we entered the scientific era where the heart was essentially transformed from this metaphorical object into a biomechanical pump uh, a complex uh fascinating pump to be sure but it was a pump something that just pumps blood and that's how modern medicine has conceptualized the heart for so so many decades now. It's a it's a machine with wires, with pipes, with walls that need to be sometimes fixed um, in various ways. And one of the arguments I make in the book is that we have to return to at least an appreciation of the emotional heart if we're going to continue to make the progress that we've gotten used to in heart disease. Uh, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, and, and you end your book talking about that. And and um, but first, I want to talk about. So we're going to get into that. I just want to talk about risk factors for heart disease. We talked a little bit about studies. Um, mm-hmm. What what are the risk factors? So the the biological risk factors. Um, for most of the U.S. population would be high blood pressure, diabetes, bad genes, in other words, a family history, um, smoking, uh, and uh, high cholesterol. So, so th- those are the, the risk factors that were elucidated from the largest um, medical you know, epidemiological study ever conducted, which is the Framingham Heart Study. Now, Framingham was l- looked at a at a very homogeneous population, essentially uh, a very white population that was mostly of Western European descent. Um, and so, those risk factors may not apply to um, at least an equal measure to um, uh, Hispanics to African Americans or to Asians. Um, and in fact, in, in, um, among South Asians, Indians, like, like myself, we have a very malignant um, uh, heart disease profile 
In fact, many Indians develop heart disease um, uh, with zero or only one Framingham risk factor. So there are probably risk factors in ethnic populations that we just don't know about because we haven't studied it. Um, mm-hmm. But for, for I would say for, for, for many Americans, uh, the five risk factors I mentioned are the key ones to try to, um, to get under control. And there are studies that have shown that, that if you can normalize those risk factors, um, you can reduce your risk of heart, uh, of, of heart disease and cardiac mortality by 60 to 80 percent. Which, which is pretty amazing. Um, yes. Now, you, you know, we know that we have to do that with heart disease. We know that, you know, if our cholesterol is high, we have to work on our diet and exercise. Um, you know, those are the, that's the common knowledge in all of this. Yes. Um, but of course, we're also talking about the, uh, the emotional part, which um wasn't mentioned in what you just said, the stress part, the, the grieving part, and all of that, yes. which, yeah, can you just talk about that? Well, the reason why it wasn't mentioned is because it's never been studied. Um, in the Framingham Heart Study, the Framing- Framingham investigators deliberately excluded psychosocial factors because it was a first-of-its-kind study, and they deliberately focused on things that were measurable like cholesterol level, blood pressure. They focused on numbers. It's very hard to measure, you know, occupational stress or marital dysfunction or, um, you know, other things that are strongly associated with development of heart disease. So they kind of ignored it. So th- this whole field is um, was retarded by... The um, by the Framingham investigators choosing to focus only on so-called biological determinants of heart disease and not psychosocial determinants. So, uh, so today, the American Heart Association still doesn't list emotional stress as a key risk factor for heart disease, even though so much observational data suggests that it is an important risk factor. So. Uh, so, you know, we need to do just so much more uh, education um, of, of doctors uh, and of patients um, about the key role that our emotions play in our heart health. I, I, I think, yeah, that especially, you know, in this conversation, I think it is important. And, I you know, I, I think they should... It just baffles me that it's not listed. I mean, just like situations like your grandfather's. I mean, things like that happen a lot. Even on on TV, we know that we have to reduce our stress if our blood pressure is high, or you know, if if we're we just know that we need to reduce our stress. I think we, I don't need to give those examples, but. Um, you know, if it's not recognized by Heart Association and recommended, we a lot of people probably think they can get away with it. Well, you know, I exercise and and um, mm-hmm. I've changed how I eat, but I'm still working 70 hours a week and, and, you know, doing blah, blah, blah. And people aren't assessing that. And for a cultural change, I, I think it, it needs to come from those places so that it, it's acceptable to make the change. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, so do you have any last words of advice for anybody listening? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, I hope people will read the book. Uh, uh, it would make, you know, it, it would make it worthwhile because I, th- I do think that the message of the book is one that, you know, should resonate with a wide readership that, that um, you know, the heart is a fascinating organ, um, that heart disease is the number one killer in the United States uh, and the world uh, among both men and women. And we need to know more about our hearts to live longer and better. And medicine has come a long way um, 
through a whole hailstorm of discoveries, mostly in the late 20th century, heart transplants, uh, stents, coronary angiograms, uh, coronary bypass surgery, defibrillators, pacemakers. I mean, it's a huge, huge list. All this stuff was discovered basically within the last half century or so. So, um, and, and we came a, a long way from, um, from the peak of cardiac mortality, which was in 1968, the year I was born. That was when more people died of, of, of heart disease in America than, than in any other year. Uh, and since then, the decline, there's been a decline in cardiac mortality, but that decline has slowed for many reasons. Um, you know, people are sedentary, uh, people are overweight, um, uh, you know, people don't exercise enough, and, and so on. But I think that also people don't pay attention to the intersection of the emotional heart and the biological heart. And, and one of the key messages of the book is that we do need to pay more attention. I describe, in a, I think, a lot of detail and in a very reader-friendly way how to understand that connection and how to act on it. And so, so I, if there's a last message, I would say that, that, that you know, it's not just the stents and the drugs, but it's how, how you love, how you um, cope with stress, how you transcend distress, these things are also a matter of life and death. Mm-hmm. Well, um, thank you so much. Is there a way that somebody can get a hold of you or your book if they want to more information or to read it? Absolutely. Um, so the book is available on Amazon um, uh, or Barnes and Noble or, or in you know most um, bookstores throughout the country. It's 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 uh, been translated into ten languages, so it's available in many foreign countries as well. And, um, and if you want to send me a message, if you just go to my website, um, Sandeep Jahar, uh, S-A-N-D-E-E-P-J-A-U-H-A-R.com, uh, you can send me a message directly from the website and uh, I'll, I, I will definitely answer it. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, if anybody wants more information about my story or what I went through, you can find that on my blog site at dr-risk.com, where you can also um, find my shows by topic. So it's a little easier to filter. Um, You can also contact me at anantacalgary at gmail.com or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Thank you so much for listening today and be sure to have today to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.